Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. A few years ago, I did a broadcast called Seth Andrews Teaches Sunday School. And that came about because I was really struck by how often you know, people are unaware of what's in the Bible. Old and New Testament, there are lots of stories in there that many weren't aware of. And so that was the broadcast from a while back. And I've had some requests to do a second round here in 2021. And no great lessons here. Not even really a lot of profound commentary about what's in the Bible beyond my humble observations. But it's always enlightening, or almost always enlightening, to open the Bible and read it with a more objective eye to find out what might be hidden within those 66 books. And that is what we're doing today. I hope you enjoy. We're always contrasting the God of the Old and the New Testament. Kind of the same character, right? Jesus said in the New Testament, I and the Father are one. Yet Jesus, he hung out with people, and he appears in human form. He's walking and talking and chilling and traveling and and speaking and dining with people. He hung out with human beings. But Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, he would have none of this. In fact, you couldn't even look at God's face, because if you gaze upon God's face, you would instantly die because there was just too much glory. And I think this sounds vaguely like a double entendre. (laughs) You know, well, I died because I looked at his glory. Sounds a little bit naughty to me, but that's just where my mind goes. I've been spending too much time with the host of Cognitive Dissonance, apparently. Okay. What happens if you don't look Yahweh in the face? What happens if you look at his ass. This is a question that comes up when you read the 33rd chapter of the book of Exodus. Now, just a quick preface, okay? Yahweh used to apparently travel with Moses and his armies, which is weird. God is everywhere. He lives in the heart of humankind. He flies around the cosmos, managing the trillion planets that he has made. You know, that's Yahweh. But apparently he also needed a tent, And so whenever the armies would encamp as they were going from town to town, smiting people in the name of Yahweh, and whatever they were doing, they had a tent called the Tent of Meeting, and it was placed outside the main camp. And this is where God lived. And so Moses would go to the Tent of Meeting, and he would communicate with God there, and he would get instructions from God. He would ask his questions of God at the Tent of Meeting. And apparently God's in the tent So you cannot see his glory, and therefore you will not die on the spot. But Moses and the people weren't happy with this. They weren't satisfied. They were out doing all this stuff in the name of Yahweh, but they felt like they didn't have enough proof that Yahweh was really calling the shots. They're trying to convince other people. We're doing the Lord's good work. But I'd like more evidence that Yahweh is telling us to do this stuff. Moses said, verse 12, "'Teach me your ways.'" so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. And God replied, hey, no problem, I'm with you. But Moses persisted. He said, you're sending us on all these quests if you don't actually show up so everybody can see us as allies, the people will not know that you are on our side, that I'm your guide, that you're pleased with your people. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth. That's Exodus 33, 15. And the Lord said to Moses, fine, fine. What are you thinking? What is it that you want? Verse 18, 
Moses said, show me your glory. But Yahweh cannot do this, the glory emanating from his face, which sounds naughty. (laughs) Maybe that's where my mind is going today. But his, his face emanates glory, okay? He's so powerful, he's so holy, mortals can't look at him. Verse 20, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Okay, fine. If no man can look at God's face, what are the other options? Well, verse 21, Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hands and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Now, I'm guessing Yahweh doesn't need clothes. I mean, he did walk and talk and do other human-like stuff, I guess. But I just don't picture Yahweh. He's just a big ball of glory, okay? So when his face goes by and you can't see that, and you see his backside, the Old Testament doesn't say ass, but what else would you be seeing? The God of the Old Testament, come on, he did not wear pants, At the very least, Yahweh was saying, hey, if you got to look at something, here's the back of my head, here's my actual back, here's the backside of my holy thighs and the perfectly symmetrical crease of my holy ass crevasse. That's what the Lord was saying. So apparently, Moses was able to gaze upon the blessed butt cheeks and he was somehow imbued with glory that would impress everyone else that he and Yahweh were actually partners in all the things that God's people were doing. Now, I don't crack myself up all that often, but I was pretty proud of holy ass crevasse. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was clever. I thought that I, I just, I'm giving myself points for that. Holy ass crevasse. I just thought that was hysterical. Okay, so the first story that we just heard apparently tells us that even though God is spirit, he has a human form. He has a head, a neck, and a torso, arms, legs, etc. And uh, perhaps this explains the creation of Adam in God's image, because Adam has all of those attributes as well. It makes no sense, of course, unless you are conjuring up a man-made God in a hugely superstitious time. But the God of the Old Testament, he had arms and legs and he walked around. Apparently, it says so in Deuteronomy 23, not only did God walk around, but he walked through the army camps that were traveling from city to city and smiting people, executing them, you know, by the tens of thousands, men and women and children and animals. In the name of God, they were just slaughtering people. And between these slaughterings, They had to set up camp, and God had a bunch of rules for what to do when you are encamped in a certain place. Check this out, Deuteronomy 23, 9. God was commanding, when you're encamped against your enemies, keep away from everything impure. If one of your men is unclean because of a nocturnal emission, he's to go outside the camp and stay there. Now, most of us know what a nocturnal emission is. And if by chance you do not know, just very quickly, it is when the male member feels extremely sexually sensitive as you sleep. And maybe you're having even a sexy dream or something. And while you sleep, you you ejaculate, okay? So you're not having sex with anybody, but you actually have that experience And uh, this usually happens to young men who have not yet, you know, limped into the hormone-numbing flaccidity of middle age. This is the pre-Viagra man who normally experiences the nocturnal emission. That's another discussion for another day. But God apparently was nervous or weird or at least concerned about people in the army having nocturnal emissions as they slept in the camp, perhaps because they'd spent so much time away from their women. More than that, though, the God of the Old Testament was concerned about where the army soldiers were going to go poop, because God would walk throughout the camp 
And apparently, according to Deuteronomy 23, God was like, hey, we don't want all this shit lying on the ground. Deuteronomy 23, 12. God commands, designate a place outside the camp where you can go relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with. And when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. Now, I think this sounds pretty reasonable. Nobody wants to have poop laying around on top of the ground everywhere, especially near your tent. Go somewhere else, take a tiny shovel, do your thing, cover it up, and leave, right? Find the obscure spot and use that. That makes a lot of sense. What makes the story interesting is why God wants the poop covered up. Verse 14, For the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and deliver your enemies to you. And I think this means Yahweh was concerned about getting shit on his sandals. Even if it's not the case that he was worried about dodging poo, it makes no sense when he says, Your camp must be holy so that he will not see among you anything indecent and turn away from you. Now, God made the processes of the human body. Ingesting food and eliminating the waste of the food, this is just a natural part of intelligent design. This is how God made us. Why in the world would poop be considered offensive or indecent to God. And honestly, if you were Yahweh, wouldn't you be a little more concerned or uncomfortable with all the soldiers who were sitting outside their tents because they had obviously experienced a nocturnal emission (laughs) in the middle of the night, right? Like, I have questions about this story. I have questions. Let's stick with the Old Testament for just a little bit longer. One of my favorite movies of all time, it's the Sam Raimi classic, Army of Darkness. It's the third film in the trilogy of The Evil Dead. And in Army of Darkness, it's amazing to see our hero, Ash Williams, and he goes to battle, he goes to war against the Army of the Dead. The dead had been reanimated. They were mostly just skeletons, but they had armor on, they were carrying swords, And they were coming after Ash inside the castle, besieging the castle. It's a great, great climax to the film. Well, there's some of this going on in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, where God was talking to Ezekiel. And he looked out, and there was this big field, and the field was covered in bones, just dry bones. And God apparently felt the need to show off his power by causing these bones to reconstitute and reanimate, to come to life. And not just the bones, but the meat on the bones. I'm going to read the scripture. This is Ezekiel 37, 1 through 15. I drew it out of the Message Bible. This is a contemporized version of scripture. I just thought it was less clunky than the NIV and the King James Version. And as I read this, The producer storyteller in me thought that this needed some Hollywood-type accoutrements to it. We need some music and sound effects. So I'm going to read. This is actually verbatim out of the Message Bible. Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 15. God grabbed me. God's spirit took me up and set me down in the middle of an open plain strewn with bones. He led me around, and among them, a lot of bones. There were bones all over the plain, dry bones, bleached by the sun. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Master God, only you know that. He said to me, Prophesy over these bones. Dry bones, listen to the message of God. God, the master, told the dry bones, Watch this. I'm bringing the breath of life to you, and you'll come to life. I'll attach sinews to you and put meat on your bones, cover you with skin, and breathe life into you. You'll come alive, and you'll realize that I am God. I prophesied just as I'd been commanded. As I prophesied, there was a sound, and oh, rustling. The bones moved 
and came together bone to bone. I kept watching, sinews formed, then muscles on the bones, then skin stretched over them, but they had no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, tell the breath, God the master says, come from the four winds, come breath, breathe on these slain bodies, breathe life. So I prophesied, just as he commanded me. The breath entered them, and they came alive. They stood up on their feet, a huge army. Then God said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Listen to what they're saying. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. There's nothing left of us. Therefore prophesy, tell them, God the Master says, I'll dig up your graves and bring you out alive, O my people. Then I'll take you straight to the land of Israel. When I dig up graves and bring you out as my people, you'll realize that I am God. I'll breathe my life into you and you'll live. Then I'll lead you straight back to your land and you'll realize that I am God. I've said it, and I'll do it. God's decree. Now, this is a straight-up Sinbad movie. Remember the old uh, stop-motion Sinbad films when he's doing battle with the, uh, you know, the stop-motion skeletons? That's one of the things that pops into my mind. But I have questions about this because, quite frankly, I think God missed a huge opportunity. He had raised not just bones, but he put sinew and meat on the bones and skin and then breathed life into them. These were living creatures. First of all, what did he do with these poor things when he was done with his little example? Did he kill them all over again? Hey, sorry to raise your hopes, pal, but I was just doing an object lesson for Ezekiel and goodbye. And they fall to the ground and start decomposing all over again. And secondly, I think there's a huge Game of Thrones type opportunity missed in the Old Testament. Because if God was so focused on traveling from city to city and smiting everybody who displeased his delicate sensibilities, I mean, he killed tens upon tens of thousands. One of the cities, it was 500,000 people slain, half of a million people slain in one excursion men women children animals okay well if this was really his thing why wouldn't you continue to reanimate the dead and put sinew and muscle and skin on them breathe life into them and then give them a sword and armor and integrate them into your existing living army We saw the Night King do it in Game of Thrones. Don't tell me the Game of Thrones writers were more clever than Yahweh. I have questions about whether Yahweh was really all that clever in the book of Ezekiel and the Old Testament. Let's skip forward, at least for the moment, to the New Testament. Did you know that Jesus Christ was a racist now, we hear all the time about the goodness of Jesus Christ. He was actually kind of an asshole. In the New Testament book of Mark, chapter 7, we get to see Jesus in action. Or in action, it depends on how you look at it. Jesus was hanging out with the disciples. He'd just been chastised by the Pharisees and the Jews for not washing his hands before he ate food. Apparently, they have this uh, very elaborate hand-washing ceremony. Jesus and the disciples said, screw a whole bunch of that, and they just chowed down without washing their hands. and That turned into a big thing. And then Jesus moves around. He's teaching. You know, he's giving us great wisdom. Honor your father and mother. By the way, if you curse your mom and dad, you're supposed to be executed. That's New Testament. That's in Mark chapter 7, verse 10. And then he went on with more teaching, sexual impurity is bad, and theft is bad, and murder is bad, and adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. That's Mark chapter 7, verse 22. Now, nowhere in this list of prohibitions did Jesus say, do not be a racist asshole. 
And that's convenient for Jesus because that's exactly what he became. Mark 7, verse 24, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret, probably because he stank because he never washed his hands. That's just a guess on my part. Verse 25, in fact, as soon as she heard about him, A woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia, and she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Now Jesus responds to the woman. He says, First, let the children eat all they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. This, my friends, is Loaded language, the children of God, the Jews, not the Gentiles. This woman was a Gentile. And the inference was that she wasn't a child of God directly, but rather one of the dogs undeserving of the provisions of God, or at least the direct provisions, right? It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And the woman pled her case, and she said, look, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs, meaning, hey, I might just be a filthy Gentile, but at least I should get some of the scraps of your mercy. And this reply changes Jesus' mind. And he says, for such a reply, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. Now, why did Jesus have to be convinced to do this deed in the first place? Non-Jewish woman walks in, hey, my daughter's infected with a demon, right? She's probably writhing and screaming and going all Linda Blair in there, and I need help. And Jesus says, well, you're not Jewish, and therefore it would be like wasting it on a dog, okay? Jesus essentially was a racist asshole, a great healer more interested in serving his own tribe, or at least serving his own tribe first, than ceasing the suffering of a young girl. And remember this story whenever a Christian tells you that Jesus wants everyone equally, come as you are into the presence of the Lord, and you shall be accepted. Jesus' track record on acceptance is pretty damn sketchy. Now, cue the apologist who want to explain this story of racism to us. This guy's name is David Lose of Mount Olivet Lutheran Church in Minnesota. He decided to write a column for the Huffington Post to tell us why this is actually a beautiful story. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, Oh yeah, sure, if Jesus was calling her a dog, I guess you could say he was kind of a jerk. But... The Bible reader needs to understand Jesus wasn't saying she was a dog, this Gentile woman, you dog, you don't deserve my mercy directly. No, no, no. He was calling her a puppy. Pastor Lowe is saying, you know, Jesus is being affectionate, not insolent. He's treating her like you would a little puppy. Hey, little puppy. I'm so glad you're a precious little puppy. You know what? I'm sorry, little puppy, but it's not quite your time yet. You're still in training. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be love language. It's also supposed to test her faith. You know, the demon hanging out in your daughter that's causing all the writhing and screaming and shouting and pain and agony and all that stuff. That can go on a few extra minutes while I pat you on the head and tell you why you are not a priority to me. And as you plead your case and convince me, I, the God with a perfect plan who would never have his mind changed by a mere mortal, I will then change my mind. Thank you, little bitty puppy, sweet puppy woman, Gentile person who is not a Jew. Racist Jesus. Thank you for the explanation, Pastor Lowe's. Jesus is also not a huge fan of the fifth commandment. John chapter 2 says that Christ wasn't just a racist asshole, he was kind of a dick to his own mother. Mary, you know, the mother of the Savior of the entire planet. Mary, who was no longer a virgin. She only needed to be a virgin, apparently, for 
that first birth. And of course, virgin was a mistranslation of the Hebrew word Alma, which just meant a young woman, so she didn't actually have to be a virgin. It's possible she was a virgin in the New Testament, but it's not required anyway. It was the day that Jesus turned the water into wine. You know that famous miracle? And I, I as an atheist, I'd be down with that. You know, like if I had to pick a miracle, you know, let's turn some water into wine. I think I'd be down with that. But he was at a wedding. He was at a a wedding in Cana in Galilee. And his mother, Jesus' mother Mary, was there along with the disciples. And it was Mary, the mother of Jesus, who made the announcement, Hey, we got a problem. There's no more wine. And Jesus responded, not by calling her mother or mom or ma'am, or something that's respectful and polite, he turned to his mom and he said, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus was now the master and father. He would do the correcting. In your own life at any age, imagine turning to your own mom and saying, Woman, in any context, Woman, why do you involve me in this conversation? Woman, consider yourself corrected by mine own hand. Mary did not get much love from Jesus during his lifetime, right? It was after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now imagine this. Imagine if you'd had a son and you would raise that son and given that son all of your love. I mean, any parent can tell you what this is like. 33 years of Jesus on planet earth doing amazing things. And then what? He's arrested. He's unfairly tried. He's convicted and horribly tortured and executed. How in the world could a mother's heart ever recover at the idea of the torture and murder of her own child? Devastating beyond words. And yet all of a sudden she started to hear the whisperings. She heard the news that Jesus had risen from the dead. Her son was somehow alive, and she had to see this for herself, and she rushed out. Luke chapter 8 says that she showed up at the house where Jesus was. Also in attendance were Jesus' brothers. Now, we don't talk a lot about the idea that Jesus had brothers, but, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? Mary was a virgin when she had Jesus. But after that, she and Joseph did get married, and they did procreate. Praise be to God, right? Joseph Joseph finally gets to use his own sperm. <laughs> Thanks, God. So in the Gospels, and also there's a verse in 1 Corinthians that talk about the brothers of Jesus. Their names were Is it Jose, J-O-S-E-S, I don't know how to pronounce that, Simon, Jude, and James the Just, which to me, you know, James the Just sounds like a character in Spongebob. Anyway, Mary and Jesus' brothers all rush out to go see if the story's true and if Jesus is actually alive. And they arrive in the town where Jesus was proclaiming the good news of God. And somebody said, hey, Jesus, your mom's here. Your mom and your brothers, they're here. They're they're outside. They're desperate to see you. And Jesus once again becomes a walking, talking hemorrhoid when he says, quote, My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. In other words, Jesus was saying, you know what? I've got another family, really. It's not about blood. It's not about My immediate family, those who invested so much in me and loved me so dearly. No, no. Believers in my word, those most loyal to me, those who follow me around, they are now my family, or at least my primary family. Tell mom and the brothers they need to just sit down, shut up, and take a number. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's a commandment that God himself broke. It's not the only one either, if you think about the Ten Commandments. Like, this is, a, this is how my mind works. Remember when the guy in the Old Testament was executed for picking up twigs on the Sabbath? That's out of Numbers chapter 15, verses 32 through 36. Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron, 
and to all the congregation, and they put him under guard, because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. Now, wait a minute. The man was picking up sticks, which constitutes work on the Sabbath. If God commanded the execution, which is an action, wouldn't that also be considered work? And if Moses and his people all went out and picked up stones and threw the stones at the man and executed him, would that not be considered a violation of the Sabbath? Hell, that sounds like work to me. Just throwing it out there, people. Violating the Sabbath as you punish somebody else for violating the Sabbath. Welcome to the Biblical Old Testament. I pay real money to see some of these stories taught without any sort of watering down. Just tell the stories. Teach them from the pulpit at Sunday Church. Oh yeah, I'd love to see some of these stories see the light of day more stories from the Bible as I teach Sunday school. Actual stuff drawn from the quote-unquote good book from the perspective of the skeptic. We continue next. We've talked an awful lot about Moses on the show today, but I want to do another story out of the Old Testament relating specifically to Moses. This is in Numbers chapter 31, verses 1 through 8, where God gets angry at Moses for not being murderous enough. Here's the story. There's a mass slaughter of the Midianites. 12,000 soldiers took up weapons, and they went into Midian, and they killed every single Man, And then they kidnapped the women and the children, and they burned everything down. Then they brought the captives, those women and children, they brought them before Moses. And Moses got pissed off at the officers of the army because he said, I want you to go in and slaughter everybody. Like, show them no mercy. Uh, This is it. I want you to go and just lay waste to everybody. Nobody left alive. And you brought me women and children? What's the deal? And the soldiers just sort of looked at Moses sheepishly and said, Whoops, sorry that we left some people alive. And Moses calls an audible. Here's what he says in Numbers chapter 31. Kill all the boys. Now, I want to stop here for just a second. Picture it in your mind. These are not men, right? They're boys. Presumably, they're teens and younger, all the way down to infant males. Boys. So Moses says, kill all the boys. How's that even done? Did the soldiers line him up in a row? Was it a melee? Did they turn it into sport? Did they construct a mini coliseum? Did they feed him to the lions? Did they cut their heads off? I mean, I'm not trying to be macabre here, what I'm saying is we need to be presented and be honest with the horror of this story and the unthinkable horror of having Moses say, just execute all the boys. The entire religion of Christianity thinks Moses is one of the greatest, most laudable, most noble, most godly, most holy, most moral figures in the scriptures. Kill all of the boys. But then Moses, the good guy in the story, takes things a step further. Numbers 31, 17, and kill every woman who has slept with a man. But save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Now let's try to figure this one out. You execute the women who've had sex. How do you determine this? How can you tell if a woman has had sex without, you know, bringing in a gynecologist or actually having sex with the woman yourself? And even then, that's not guaranteed to determine whether she's a virgin. What the hell? How do you know which women are the virgins and which aren't? And then imagine the execution of the non-virgin women. 
Imagine soldiers coming into your town, kidnapping your mom and your sister and all the women in your life, and then taking them out and putting them in a big group somewhere and then hurting them. Okay, we want virgins on the left and we want non-virgins on the right. And the non-virgins, we're going to slice and dice with our sword because the good guy of the story, Moses, told us to do so. And then what happens to the girls who are still virgins? They become the property of the soldiers. Moses' army, Moses' male soldiers just go in and go shopping. Keep the virgin girls for yourselves. Absolutely, I think churches should teach this story. In fact, I think they should make it an object lesson. Here's what they ought to do. They ought to have a Sunday sermon, and in the middle of the sermon, as they're teaching out of Numbers chapter 31, they actually divide the congregation. Okay, everybody, on this side, I need the men, the boys, uh, the non-virgin women, and all the girls, uh, the young girls who desecrated their bodies by engaging in sexual congress. I need you all here on the left. Okay, right side of the room, uh, give me the virgin girls. Just go over there, stand against the wall, okay? I know you're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, whatever, you know. Uh, just stay over there. You know, you're all against that wall. Now, over here, I've got my board of deacons. They're all men. I consider them God's good army. I want the deacons to go down, and they're going to each select a girl to own, You know, just like a day at the buffet, they're just going to go by and pick whatever they find the most appetizing. Congratulations, deacons. You've got a fresh girl to do with whatever you please. And then everybody here on the left, consider yourselves dead, executed, slaughtered, sliced to ribbons by sword because the good Lord above said that you must be killed. And I'm stunned by the apologist who read Numbers chapter 31 and immediately go into a, it's an offensive kind of rationalization. Well, yes, they killed all the men and yes, they killed all the non-virgin women. But you know what? When they took the virgin girls for themselves, the soldiers weren't taking them so they could have sex with them. They were actually rescuing them so that they would not be killed, adopting them into their families, perhaps like daughters or maybe as bond servants, so that they could, you know, continue to live and have some semblance of a future. You know, it's like it really is a wonderful thing when they went and kidnapped the virgin girls. The Lord is just. Oh, it's exhausting. Back to the New Testament, here's a story. It's not really a moral lesson or an immoral lesson. I just thought it was interesting, and I could kind of relate to it. And I was really struck by the fact that no one knows about this story, even though it's right there in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. That verse says, Paul writes, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. Now, I read that to mean breaking bread is what? Dinner time or supper time, depending on what part of the country you're in. All right, let's generously say 6 p.m. All right, 7 p.m., okay? And Paul talked until midnight. That's at least five straight hours. Well, there's a guy who was listening. His name was Eutychus, okay? And he had perched himself in an upstairs window, three floors up. He'd perched himself in his window when he's listening to Paul. And Paul kept talking and talking and talking. Those of us who have sat through a Sunday sermon, a long Sunday sermon, know exactly how this feels. Talking and talking. And you're looking at your watch and you're doodling in the church bulletin and you're looking around, wondering if anybody else is just as bored to death as you are, Eutychus was feeling some of that. And he did what you and I would probably do. He fell asleep during this long-ass sermon. But he's sitting in a window three stories up, and he fell out the window, fell all the way to the ground, bam! And he was killed when he landed. 
And Paul stopped preaching, and he went over, and he threw himself on the man and raised him from the dead. It was a bona fide praise Jesus miracle. And after that, they broke some more bread. And then what did Paul do? Paul started preaching again. Verse 11 says he was, quote, talking until daylight. Now, let's say sunrise is 6 o'clock. That's 11 straight hours of preaching. If you were listening to an 11-hour sermon, do you think you could do it without falling asleep? You know, we see the healing miracle quite a bit in the Bible. My question about Christ is, why did Jesus so often seem to want to do things the hard way? Like if it was you and me, we'd figure out a way to sort of economize the healing experience. But Jesus, no. Jesus likes to show off. All right, let's say that you and I had healing powers, and wouldn't that be amazing? I have healing powers. My next door neighbor, he's blind, been blind since birth. He knows I've got this power. He comes over and he says, hey, look, I've heard you've got the power to heal my eyes. Can you help a brother out? What's the first thing I do? I just reach out and I touch his eyes or I just speak the words, be ye healed and voila, the man is healed. He can totally see. Jesus can do this. Jesus can even heal inadvertently. Like, he didn't even have to reach out and touch you. You can go and touch him. We saw this throughout the New Testament. He did it with the bleeding woman in three of the Gospels. This woman who had the issue of blood, been bleeding for 12 years. All she had to do was touch the cloak of Jesus, and boom, she was healed. Jesus speaks the healing words. He did it with the deaf and mute guy in Mark chapter 7. The guy shows up, and Jesus reaches out, just touches his ears, and then he touches his tongue, and Pow! Instant healing. And this way, Jesus Christ healed withered limbs, and he calmed deadly storms, and he cast out devils, exorcisms conducted merely by a quick spoken word. And yet Jesus so often does not do this. He takes the long way around the barn, as they say. Just a few examples out of the New Testament. The Gospel of John talks about a guy who was blind from birth, Jesus says, oh, wow, look, he's blind. Jesus does not merely snap it away with his fingers to heal his eyes. Jesus reaches down and he grabs a pile of dirt and (laughs) spits into it. And then he mashes it all together and he makes this nasty, spitty dirt paste. And then he takes the nasty, spitty dirt paste and he jams it into the guy's eye sockets. (laughs) Okay, picture it in your mind. The guy sitting there with spit mud in his eye sockets there, and he sends the poor guy off to wash his eyes. Go wash them in the pool of Salome. And so he did so, apparently with help, I guess. Someone led him there, and then he dipped his face into this gigantic holy eye wash station, and boom, the man's sight returned, and he went home to show his family And if I were him, I would have been rubbing my eyes with some disinfectant wipes, like spitty mud in your eyes. Jesus even did things the hard way when he handled money. The miracle of the fish and the coin, Matthew 17. He's at the temple of Capernaum. And a couple of tax collectors show up. And they say, hey, why hasn't Jesus paid the temple tax? I'm guessing this is the equivalent of you know, dropping 40 bucks for entry into the ark encounter. Like, you're going to go to the temple, you got to pay. And Jesus doesn't just blink the coins or speak the coins into existence. He doesn't do one of those little magic tricks they do on the street where they sort of reach behind the ear, grab the coin. Oh, look, a quarter. He doesn't do that. No, Jesus wants to show off. Now, Simon's with him. He says, hey, Simon, go to the lake and throw out your line and take the first fish you catch. And I want you to open its mouth and you will find a four drachma coin. And a drachma in today's dollars could be worth up to a hundred bucks. Okay. The values vary, but let's call it a hundred dollars, which is pretty steep for access to the temple. Jesus tells Simon, I want you to take that coin and give it to the tax collectors to cover both of us. Now think about this. Think about your own fishing trips. 
How long did this whole process take you? All right, fine. I got to get the fishing gear. And is there line on the pole? And do I have the bait? And now I've got to go down and get to the water. Let's drop the line or lines in the water. Finally, a nibble. We catch the fish and return home. How long did that take? Even if the lake is close, how long does that take? And Simon was instructed to take the coin out of the fish's mouth before he got back to the temple. So I guess he's still in the boat or on the shore. Simon is the only one who saw this miracle happen. The tax collectors, they didn't know any different. For all they knew, Simon just took forever to leave and go fish the spare change out of the console of his, I don't know, his donkey or his mule, whatever he's traveling on, okay? Why wasn't someone clever enough to capitalize on a fish that produces money? Uh, why did no one immediately say, holy shit, there's money coming out of the fish? <laughs> I will now go and open the first Capernaum bank of fish mouth. That's the first thing I would do. No safe required to keep all the money because there is no money. All you do is go grab the fish. Hell, you just put a fish tank in the lobby or behind the counter and boom, instant coin whenever you need it. But I digress. Okay, I think that this tendency with Christ shows us the nature of Christ. Jesus wants things to be more difficult than they need to be. And this is true with the gospel message, which explains why so often he wrapped a critical gospel message in parables. And this is evident, especially in Mark chapter 4. Jesus just tells us, look, we think Jesus wants us to know his message and to be saved. The people gathered around Jesus in Mark chapter 4, and they said, what's the deal? What's going on here? Why do you always speak in parables when we just want to know what it is you're trying to say? Jesus responded, and he said, quote, And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Meaning, Jesus was playing favorites. He found a select group of people and he said, you get to know the mystery, but it is a mystery. And those that are without, right, they're not here in the inner circle, perhaps the heathen, the unwashed, the unsaved. All these things are done in parables. I have specifically made myself much harder to understand with eternity at stake. I've got my freshly created hell. You know, it's all set up, it's ready for the writhing and the screaming of the unsaved. But the kingdom of God, it needs to be mysterious. It has to be a puzzle. I am making things harder to understand on purpose. And if somebody's just not smart or clever enough to figure out my parables, well, doesn't that just suck for them? Back to the Old Testament, because I want to talk about giants. Did you ever see the film Noah with Russell Crowe? It's actually not bad. I think it was an Aronofsky movie that came out a few years ago. And some Christians went to go see Noah because, hey, I want to go see the Bible come to life on the big screen. And they got pissed and they were upset because of the variations and the changes that uh, the film took from some of the Bible verses, which to me is just hysterical. I'm sorry, the global flood story is absolutely legitimate until you add, you know, rock monsters into it. And there were these awesome rock monsters, those cast down from heaven and cursed by God, who ended up helping Noah to construct the ark, which makes a shit ton more sense than having a 500-year-old man pretty much by himself build a stadium-sized boat out of trees and tar. Rock monsters, to me, makes a lot more sense. <laughs> you know, he's got cheap, skilled labor. That makes a whole lot of sense. So 500-year-old human beings, oh, that's fine. Penguins in the desert, that's fine. Lions and lambs lying together. Maybe even velociraptors on the ark, that's perfectly reasonable. Giant rock monsters, that's just not credible. Mm -mm, not believable. Mm -mm. They strayed from the sacred word, and it's a desecration of Genesis chapter 6. 
But again, those creatures in the film were actually based on Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Quick digression, by the way. The average lifespan 4,000 years ago was closer to 50, not 120. But back to the uh, Bible. It says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. The Nephilim, N-E-P-H-I-L-I-M. They were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Now cue the apologists once again, and they're going to gripe and complain and argue about what are the Nephilim. Some biblical translations, including the KJV, say that the Nephilim were giants, these big fallen angels, and they dropped down out of heaven or were kicked out of heaven to inhabit the land of Canaan at the time of the Israelite Conquests. Some people say, no, it's not giants, it's fallen ones or fallen angels. I myself, I'm going with giants. The Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint, it translates the words to gigantus, giants. Others point to the Hebrew word nephal, which means to fall. I'm sticking with giants. Other references in Deuteronomy and Numbers speak of giants. So it works for me. In the uncanonized book of Enoch, which they heavily rely on to try to flesh out this story, the book of Enoch called them great giants whose height was 3,000 L's, E-L-L-S. You know what an L is? An L is about a foot and a half, 18 inches. So picture in your mind a creature that is 3,000 L's tall. That's almost a mile. I think it comes out to like 4,500 feet. These creatures are supposed to be doing it with human women. What? How's that even possible? Like in your mind, I know, I see in your brain right now, you are imagining how this might even look. Yeah, we had 4,500 foot tall fallen angel giant creatures and they were having sex with human women. And we'd like you to believe this. Welcome to religion. Okay, fine. Let's say they were giants, but they were less tall. Let's say they were slightly taller than the average NBA all-star. Genesis 6, 4 says they were hooking up with human women. The Bible actually says they got married to these women. What, did they have a ceremony? Hey, we'd like you to show up on Saturday at 2 o'clock. Susan's marrying a giant. What's that even look like? And then the sex, giant on human action, which produced children. Now, there doesn't appear to be an ending to this story. There's not even much of a point to the story. (laughs) The Nephilim and apparently everybody else, including the mighty men of renown or the offspring or whatever, everybody got wiped out in the Great Flood. Everybody got wiped out except for Noah and his family. But if you tell a Christian, hey, did you read that story in the Old Testament about giants falling out of the sky to get down and get funky with women? Tell them this story in any other context. Hey, you know, the Quran talks about giants falling from the sky to procreate with human women and produce offspring on this earth. They say, that's crazy. Tell them it's in the books of the Vedas. That's crazy. Tell them it's in Harry Potter. That's entertaining, but crazy. Then open the Christian Bible and point to the first verse of Genesis chapter 6 and say, Now how absolutely crazy do you think this story is? And watch their cognitive dissonance kick in. Okay, one more from the Old Testament before we wrap things up. Try this scenario with the believer and tell him it came from a different religion. Just change the names of the story, which I will do here. At the first, the story goes like this. (music) 
the warrior Aragorn <laughs> had pleased the great king Theoden. And Theoden promoted Aragorn to lead the army. And Aragorn enjoyed great respect among the troops, and he enjoyed his favor under Theoden's rule. And yet, Aragorn's success became a problem, as he became more popular than even the king himself, and Theoden became jealous. An evil spirit infected the king, stoking jealousy so powerful that it caused him to plot Aragorn's assassination. But it needed to look like a death that happened organically, not an execution, or the people would turn against him. Aragorn was madly in love with the king's daughter, Arwen, and sought her hand in marriage. And so Theoden the king hatched his plan and told Aragorn to bring him as a dowry 200 Urukai foreskins as a wedding dowry. First of all, I'm sorry, a wedding dowry of foreskins? Secondly, do the Urukai have foreskins? I mean, they're monsters, but I guess they're male monsters, so they would have penises. Did they have foreskins? I don't know. That's a logistics question. Let's move on. Aragorn rushed to battle, and he slayed the evil Saruman's army and harvested not a hundred foreskins, but two hundred foreskins to present to the king, and Aragorn was given the hand of Arwen Evanstar to become his bride under the jealous eye of the king, a jealous eye that would make he and Aragorn enemies for all of the rest of their days. Now, forgive me for stealing from Tolkien, okay? But I'm just not clever enough to think up actual character names on my own, so I just stole those. Plus, I kind of like the Lord of the Rings vibe for this story. It's, you know, it conjures a certain mental image. And I want to look at the story. I mean, beyond the bat shittery of saying, hey, it's a wedding dowry. Don't bring me money or linens or material goods or servanthood or some pledge for loyalty. No, no. I want a hundred fleshy tips of Philistine penises. I mean, <laughs> beyond that, beyond that, it really is kind of an interesting story. It's kind of got a Joseph Campbell vibe to it about the hero's journey, right? It's not all that original, but it is interesting. And I think it strikes us right off the bat as a work of fiction. It's a fabrication. It's a myth. It's a legend. Aragorn seeks the hand of Arwen, and he must survive the battle. He must survive the plot of the jealous and murderous Theodon, the king. This is fiction, not fact, my friends. So when we change those names to the names in the Bible out of 1 Samuel 18, it was David, the prophet, and Saul, the king, and Saul's daughter, Michael, suddenly the believer treats this story not like mythology, but like history, including the acceptance of the wedding dowry of 200 bloody, fleshy foreskins, and once again, welcome to what religion does to the human brain. I always enjoy these excursions into scripture, my friends. It's such a revelation, if you'll pardon the expression. I so appreciate you listening. Thanks for your support of this show. I'll see you back here next week, and you take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.